We're going to look at the story of David and I'm going to highlight to you four simple thoughts. The first thing that I want to mention, and if you're taking notes, write this down. The pursuit of God prepares you for what God is planning for your life. The Bible says that Saul was rejected by God and God chose David as the king. But God didn't play lottery in choosing David. God didn't just simply say, mini, mini, money. Uh, oh, David. Yeah, right there. <laughs> David. The Bible makes it clear there was a prerequisite. There was something that qualified David to be God's chosen servant. Now, today God is not choosing kings over Israel. Most of us, when I'm talking about our calling, God wants you not to be the one who is only called. God wants you to be the one that is also chosen. Somebody say chosen. Not chosen frozen, but chosen and on fire. Chosen and called by God. Many people are called. Many of us don't get chosen. There is a prerequisite that distinguishes us from the mass from the herd, from the crowd. And God makes a testimony about David. You heard testimonies today during the baptism. When people gave testimonies of God. God saved me. God healed me. God delivered me. There is a time when God gives testimony of you. The Bible says the Lord testified of David. What kind of testimony do you think God will give? about you. Well, I know the testimony he gave about David. He said this about David. This man David is a man after my heart. Our testimonies go like this. I was in darkness, now I'm in the light. I was addicted to drugs, now I'm set free. I was sick and now I'm healed. I was blind, now I see. God's testimony goes slightly different. This person is different than others. Why? Because their generation seeks after things. He seeks after me. As David was seeking after God, something as a teenager distinguished him from the rest of the people. God took notice of that and his pursuit of God started to prepare him for what God was planning for him. Ministry is an overflow of our pursuit of God. Ministry is not an overflow of our gifts, skills and talents. Ministry is not an overflow of our abilities, education, connections or well I'm connected to pastor. Well, I'm connected to one of the main families in the church. Therefore, I am in ministry. You can be in ministry position like that, but God's calling on your life is never connected to your family connections or even other things. It's connected to your pursuit of Him. Can somebody say amen? amen. God seeks those that go after Him. The scripture clearly states in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 that God rewards those that diligently pursue Him. What made David different is that David was after God. Where I find people who are discouraged, disappointed. I'm tired from serving. I don't want to serve ministry anymore. I'm burned out. Church hurt. I'll never do it again. Why? I've tried it. Underappreciated. Overcriticized. Too much demand. Too much pressure. You look at those people's personal life and you will find something very common denominator between all of them. It's not that the church hurt them, the ministry burned them out. It's the root system was too shallow and the weight of their responsibilities overwhelmed them. Not because responsibilities were heavy, because roots were short. We live in Tri-Cities and we are cursed with wind. We get a lot of it and dust that the wind creates. Winds get so strong in Tri-Cities, they topple trees. And one of the things that ex wind exposes is how shallow the root system of the trees in Tri-Cities. When the wind comes through and the trees topple, the trees turn over and you see this beautiful big tree you drive by every single day and you find out that the root system was mile wide and just few feet deep. And that's why they stood well when everything was well. But when things didn't go well, and as things always don't go well, the trees toppled. They were turned over and they fell. What kept David grounded in serving God all his life, and the Bible says he served God in his generation. 
through drama, trauma, abuse, criticism, attacks, misunderstood, falsely accused, tr somebody tried to kill him with the spear, his own father-in-law, all of that stuff. You don't see David becoming bitter, angry, mad, suing and all of this stuff. You see David has a testimony from God, a man after my heart. Being on fire for Jesus is the only protection, guarantee we have to not let anything we go through in ministry completely consume us. When you've done ministry for a long time, you know how things are ran, especially if you've done things on the stage, up close with leaders and pastors. It's kind of like this. If you know how the sausage is made, you don't eat sausage. I meet people sometimes who've been in the ministry for a long time and they tell me, they're like, I know how this stuff works and that's why I'm no longer in ministry. I said, I understand you, but I also know one thing about you. You don't know God. I count everything as rubbish to know Him. What separated David from every other man is that David wasn't a professional. He was passionate pursuer of God. Being professional it's not what God is looking. God is looking for lovers, pursuers and those who are after Him. He will give them whatever is necessary to accomplish their purpose. It was amateurs that built the ark and professionals built Titanic. God is looking for people in the pursuit after Him. If all you have it's just bad experience with serving church, burned out. I don't want to condemn guilt trip or discredit the validity of your painful experience. What I want to tell you, there is a furnace hotter than any breakup or hurt. And that furnace is the liquid love of God. When it burns you on the inside, you become unstoppable. And God wants people who are in ministry, not just to be good in ministry, but to be good in prayer, good in pursuit after Him, good in fasting, good in seeking after Him. Why? Because that qualifies them for growing in ministry. Can someone say Amen? The second thing that I would like to highlight and that is this. God gives power to meet the demands of service. I want you to notice this in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the Bible says in verse 13 and verse 14. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. I find it interesting that in every time God calls a man or a woman in the Bible, he doesn't send them to a college. He sends them anointing. College is important. University is important. Skills are important. Being able to communicate, play instruments is important. Organize, structure and manage things is very important. God used many times very smart people like Moses and like Apostle Paul. They helped to write things. Moses helped to structure a bunch of slaves into a, 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 a nation. But one common thread that runs from the beginning to end is every person God calls, He gives them power. Why does He give them power? Because the task God calls us to do without power is not going to be accomplished. Think of this. You have a way of cutting a tree with scissors or power tools. If you take your scissors and you come to a tree and you say, well, it cuts paper. Trees are kind of paper. I'm going to cut the tree with scissors. You take these scissors, you will be there till the coming of Antichrist and the second coming of Christ. The tree won't fall. You need power tools to accomplish a task. Now for a paper, scissors are enough. To cut the tree, scissors are insufficient. The kind of calling God has for us. Now some of you may say, well, I'm just greeting. I'm leading a small group. I don't need a lot of power. Everything that has to do with assaulting the gates of hell 
rescuing people from the kingdom of darkness to kingdom of light discipling your children in a woke brainwashed culture that does not know what man is and what a woman is and is trying to put men in women's bathrooms in a culture that calls abortion a choice in a culture that is completely messed up in their foolishness when it comes to morality and all this relativism in this culture you need not scissors to disciple your children you need power tools and God promises power teenager I think someone said about 15 years of age God calls a teenager at the age of about 15 15 16 and he gives him power, what we call anointing, to accomplish a task. Stress in life comes from three main sources. It comes from the demands of service. It comes from the deception of sin and the demise of Satan. When we serve, the Bible says, Jesus says power left him. We can experience depletion we can experience emptiness because we feel empty because we we lose that fuel when we serve when we commit sin we lose power the bible says that samson felt power leave him not because he was serving it's because he was sinning we can also lose power when demonic attacks happen to us the bible says the distressing spirit came upon saul and he was weak after that when it comes to ministry or serving in God's house, serving God's purposes in your life, there are four problems that come with it. The first one is the pressure from the position. The second one is the pain from people. The third one is the pushback from the devil. And the fourth one is the problems from within. Let me just quickly go through this. Pressure from our position. You don't have to be a pastor but just being in the position of being a parent there is a pressure that's involved with that you have to provide you have to think about everything your kids are not even thinking about for those of you who have a business you have an employee you have employees under your care your employees go to sleep you're thinking about when the next contract will come you're making sure the LNI is not on your case. You're making sure everybody wears all that they need to wear. You're literally, there is pressure no one understands until somebody had employees to manage. You live with this, it never turns off. There is a pressure that comes with it and it stresses you out. People say, well, don't, don't worry about it. That is the dumbest thing you can tell somebody who has a position that carries pressure. After the pressure from the position comes pain from people. The position itself has pressure. But then if you have anything to do with people, people don't add pressure, they add pain. Now they're also the source of greatest pleasure in this world and they're the source of the deepest pains you'll ever experience in your life. There are people you work with, there are people who work for you, there are people you work for and the people that are around you. I'll testify concerning church. Being in the church, you know, when I was younger, I wished one day to be the lead pastor of Hungry Gen so I can make all the decisions. And one day our pastor was gone to Ukraine for about one month and I was just a youth pastor. I was so excited. Finally, I can be the boy, the, the man. No, not the boy. I didn't want to be the boy. I wanted to be the man. And we had a situation where in one week, we had two or three deacons decided to attack me about what we need to change in the church and I didn't know what to do I didn't know who to say yes to and I was like just wait for the pastor They're like well you're the guy now you make the decision in those three days I was praying to God that God sends the pastor back that week and I was convinced I will never be a pastor again I was like why do I want this pressure now they're all criticizing me they're all expecting me to make those decisions that Sunday a girl that comes to our church for prayer line decides to manifest during the prayer. We bring her here and the demon doesn't even speak and for 15 minutes I'm commanding the demon to go in the back of my head. I was like, where is the pastor? Where is where's the real pastor? I'm not supposed to be doing this. I felt like sons of Sceva for a moment. Thankfully we delivered her and after that week I was like, I'm tired. And we still have three more weeks to go. When the pastor came back, I was grateful. I said, God, 
the dream I had, scratch it. I have no idea what I was thinking about. I want to stay under somebody else's covering. I don't want to take the hits. I don't want to be criticized. I don't want to be responsible. I don't want the spotlight because the spotlight carries heat. I only thought about the spotlight. I didn't know you had to also endure the pressure from the heat that comes with it. And when I tasted that as a teenager, I learned something. With great position comes even greater responsibility. Nobody knows until it lands on your shoulders. The pressure that comes with it. The people's hurt. That one comment. It could be 20 compliments and that one comment gets under your skin and you're thinking about it in the shower. For three days you're, you're preparing a sermon how next Sunday, this person is gone from the church but it's still inside of you. <laughs> Matthew Barnett said, you want to be a bridge to a dying world, you have to be ready to be walked upon. We all pray, Lord make me a servant and then people treat us like services like, God, this church just doesn't love people. Well, we ask God to make us like servants. What do you think servants get treated like royalties? No. And that hurts because that's rejection. That, that is hurt. That is somebody leaving. That is somebody saying this. That is somebody not understanding. That is somebody expecting you to be their Jesus Messiah 24-7 available and that carries hurt. The third thing, if you think you're done with people, then if people are okay, position seems to be okay, then the devil comes out of nowhere. Bam! Starts attacking you. You're like, come on, leave me alone! I'm already serving. I already have a lot of pressure. I'm already hurting from some of the people that are attacking me. And now the devil comes like, well, I have, I'm not done with you and throws few punches. And if you think that's not enough, you also are a flawed human being who have desires, cravings, passions that need to be crucified. And those things begin to surface. All these four come at once and it's a recipe for disaster. Now what God does is this. God doesn't come and say, oh, it's so bad. People are hurting you. Let me go change the people. God doesn't come and say, oh, it's so hard to be a pastor. Well, let me just pull you away. We'll just not make anybody a pastor. Oh, it's so hard to be a father. Well, you know what? Go and not be a father. Oh, it's so hard to be in this position. Let me just relieve the stress from this position. God doesn't reduce the pressure, the pain, the pushback, and even the problems. What He comes is He says, let me give you power to meet the demands of pressure. Let me give you power to meet the pushback against the devil. Let me give you power to deal with the hurt that can come from people. Let me give you power to deal with your personal demons and your personal problems because God doesn't make us pitiful. He makes us powerful. God is in building wimps. He's building warriors. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, gives me power. And it's come hell high water. When the devil comes like a flood, the Spirit of God doesn't run. He comes against him with power. That's why ministry without power will destroy you. Doing serving without relationship with God and to receive that fresh deposit of power regularly, you will get overwhelmed. The problem is not the ministry is hard. You're weak. You are not strong enough for the ministry unless God supplies power. That's why God gave David not a university course on how to kill giants. The Bible says he poured his spirit on the teenager and said, now you're powerful. Go to the lions. Go to the bears. No teenager can kill a lion unless God adds super to your natural. No young man 17 years of age can kill a Goliath unless God adds super to your natural. If you feel overwhelmed, if you feel burned out, if you feel tired, from the responsibilities of life, from the pressure of your position, from the pushback you experience from the enemy. I want to tell you something, you are not weird. It's normal. That's why God's remedy is power. Those who wait upon the Lord shall... I can't hear you. 
Interesting, the Bible doesn't say those who wait upon the Lord, He removes their pressure. What most of us think is if I wait on God, He'll get rid of my husband. If I wait on God, He will cause the people that cause me suffering to just disappear. Sometimes, sometimes, God doesn't remove the things that stress you out. He simply renews the strength that you walk on those things others drown in. Peter was drowning in the sea Jesus was walking upon. That whatever is over your head is under His feet. And when you get into His presence, when God releases power, it's not that those things don't hurt anymore. It's that they can't touch you and destroy you anymore because you're walking with power. You know, in our ministry, we value the relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because what the kind of ministry we do guys, this is not a social club. We're not here to sing Kumbaya two songs and say a happy pat message and just, just go live better. A, a kid that's slicing their wrists, they don't need just a positive affirming message. They need power. A, a person that is seeing nightmares, they don't need just a song. They need the Spirit. People need something that can take them from darkness to light. Something that can give them purpose. When mama maybe wasn't there, daddy wasn't there, take all those demons out of that person and put a purpose inside of that person. My friend, that is not done. Through our human efforts, it requires power. That's why God told His disciples, Jesus said to them, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive power. We need that in the ministry. Under no circumstances should you discredit yourself, even if you're doing sound, you're doing video, you're helping with counseling for the prayer line, you're helping with the administrational work and maybe you get overwhelmed and you get depleted. Please understand, the ministry you're involved in is unlike construction. It's unlike the other work that you do outside. You're dealing with the gates of hell. There is going to be pushback and God is not going to reduce that pushback. He's just going to simply elevate you so much that you punch, 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 punch. And the devil would wish he never started the fight. Because of the power the Holy Spirit gives to us. Can somebody say amen? amen. God's appointing requires God's anointing. God is interested in renewing our strength, not just removing the stress, that comes from the demands of service. There is an anointing that's inside of us that every Christian has and there is an anointing that's on us that every Christian has access to. We call it the inner anointing and the outer anointing. The inner anointing is for you in you. The outer anointing is upon you for others. Inner anointing affects your walk. The outer anointing affects our work. Inner anointing stills you. You get into His presence and there is a stillness that happens. Outer anointing stirs you. You, you go, you want to go, let's, let's go. You know, it's like Jehu, he just wants to go. Wah! You know, and it's not hype. It's that holy fervency that hits you. Inner anointing teaches you. Outer anointing, actually you teach others. Inner anointing cannot be transferred, but the outer anointing can be transferred. Inner anointing produces spiritual fruit. Outer anointing activates spiritual power. When we don't grieve the Holy Spirit, we cultivate that inner anointing. But when, when, when we don't quench the Spirit, we release that outer anointing. All of us have access to God's power. This anointing that comes upon us, but it's accessed or it's released through two simple means. A visitation that you have from God or an impartation that you receive from a person that God uses. Let me give you an example. In the Bible we see Moses has a visitation from God and he receives power. Joshua receives impartation from Moses and he walks in power. 
we see Elijah most likely received a visitation from God. We don't know where he came from. We don't know how he got the power. But we see that Elisha receives impartation from Elisha and he operates in power. We see the same thing with disciples of Jesus. They receive that impartation on the day of Pentecost. Fire, tongues, everything comes out. But in the Samaria, city of Samaria, they come, they lay hands on the other people and other people receive that power. Apostle Paul has a visitation from God on the road to Damascus. But he lays hands on Timothy and Timothy receives impartation from Paul. What does that mean? God has supernatural visitation with some people and they immediately receive power. Their life changes afterwards. Now for the rest of us, we're like, man, well that sucks because God missed me. No, no, no. God allows that on purpose so that the rest of the people can receive the access. We already have that in our spirit, in the Holy Spirit, but it gets activated when we allow other people to pray for us through the laying on of the hands, through prophetic words, and then that visitation that they experienced activates something in our own life that we now begin to walk in the same dimension of power that those people walked in. Why? Because these special encounters with God are meant to be shared with the rest of the body. So that we live in dependence on each other. We live interdependent on every one of us. In our church, we believe in the doctrine of laying on of the hands. The Bible says to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The Bible says that Jacob laid hands on his sons and imparted a blessing. The Bible says priests would lay hands on an animal and transfer sin upon that animal. The Bible says Jesus laid hands on his disciples and he blessed them and released them. The Bible says they laid hands on Apostle Paul and, and upon other disciples and released them into the missionary work. When we lay hands on the people, if you're walking in the power of God, you can impart God's gifts through laying on of hands. The Bible teaches that. That's how Timothy received the gift. So those of you who are like, man, I don't feel like I had those special encounters. I want to receive that power. Please understand, that's why we are in this church. So that we all can, when the wave rises, when the tide rises, all ships rise. God's power on our life, on the life of our pastors, is so that every person walks healing the sick, casting out demons, prophesying, preaching the gospel. Why? Because that anointing that some receive from visitation is meant to be shared with the rest of us. When we had men and women of God come to our church many times, we had them pray for us. I would go to Ukraine, to Africa, to different parts and one of the things that we would ask is that anointing that they carry, that they impart on our life. Because we believe in not only visitation but impartation. Can somebody say amen? amen? Now I do want to mention something about impartation because you can receive a lot of impartation and do nothing with it. Impartation does not work if you don't. Let me say that again. People come up and this happens all the time. Pastor pray for me. Give me your, give me your anointing. Okay. Then, <laughs> this happens all the time, <laughs> they go to Ilya, Ilya, give me also the anointing. Rickard. So by the time they're done, they collected seven mantles. <clears throat> this one particular person, <laughs> I went to a different conference next week and I, had them do, I saw them doing exactly the same thing to every pastor. And all they've been doing is collecting mantles. Imagine getting 27 coats, but you don't wear one. You have to then, when you receive the impartation, you got to work it. That's why God spoke to Saul when he received the impartation. Samuel said this, when these signs come to pass, he says, do what the occasion demands. Meaning you got to do something. You got to give it an outlet. It's kind of like this. If you got power connected to your house, plug something in. Because you can have so much power. If you don't plug anything in, it won't work. 
So you gotta plug something in. That means find a bear, find a lion, find a Goliath, find somebody to pray for, find somebody to minister to. Begin to flow by faith and exercise your faith because anointing won't work if you don't work. Many people receive more mentors than they have time to exercise them. And then they keep looking for this glorious ministry opportunity. God's anointing on your life is not only so you can just simply collect more anointing and collect more anointing. Paul tells Timothy, do not quench the gift of God inside of you. <sighs> Fan the flame. <sighs> Meaning work it what you received. Work what you got because then it will increase. It's like a muscle. Everybody has it but some of us have it covered with layers of fat. And if you exercise it, it will grow. If you exercise it, it will increase. So is with the anointing of God. It will increase as you exercise it. You don't need a stage to exercise that anointing. All you need is some human being. It could be a child in the nursery, in the kids zone. That you minister to them, you love on them, you pray for them. It could be your co-worker. It could be somebody online. It could be your children. You lay hands on them when they are sick and the anointing starts to flow. Can somebody say amen? amen? Anointing will not flow if we simply receive the mentals, receive the anointing and never do anything with it. Number three, David receives anointing and the Bible says that David after that starts to move in this anointing slowly. He was about 15 years of age when Samuel anointed him. But David became a king over one tribe at the age of 30. Then at the age of 37, he became the king of all Israel. Write this down. Slow success builds your character. Quick success grows your ego. God, after 15, when he anointed him, did not put him on the throne. When God gives you his promise of what he's going to do through you, typically God promises fast and trusts slow. God promises a lot, trusts a little. It's the way the Lord operates. At 15 he says you're gonna be the king and then only at 37 he becomes a king of the all 12 tribes. Why does God do that? Why does God almost like tease you? At 14 you go to a conference, the prophet says you're gonna to touch the world. And then you still have to go back to middle school. You still have to finish your high school. You still have to go through all of that stuff. Why does God allow that? There are a few things I want to highlight. One, when God anoints us, men do not appoint us right away. Men don't respond the same way God does. Your parents won't respond the same way God does. God can come to you in a dream and says, you're the great apostle to the nation. Mom will wake up and says, go clean your room. And you're like, Mom, you just disrespected the great apostle. And she will say, you say that one more time. Not only you'll be stripped of your apostleship, but you'll be stripped of your, you will be in a timeout. How can you put a great apostle in a timeout? Mom is like, well, you'll see how it will be very simple. David gets anointed. You know what his father does to him? Sends him back to the sheep. It's almost like his dad said, well, that was great. Awesome, David, back to the sheep. Did you just hear? I'm a king. Uh, yeah. Anyway, back to the sheep. David kills Goliath. You would think this would be a good moment. Change the status on Facebook. L lose the sheep and simply say, I'm available. Uh, where's the university where they train kings? I'm ready. The Bible says David occasionally would go back to the sheep again and again. Why? Because just because God anointed you, men will not appoint you for a long time. Oh, because those men, they're not sensitive to God. No, it's because you're not mature. It's nothing to do with men being bad. It's that God allows the process where He wants to develop you. Why? Because character grows when you have too much anointing and very little opportunity. Too much potential, but nobody's trusting you with the position that matches your potential in the church. Uh, they're disrespecting. They don't know why I have a PhD. But do you have a PhD in patience? 
but do you have PhD in serving and being small in your own eyes? Oh, that's just not fair. They're not letting me have the position that I have anointing for. They don't understand. I can heal the sick. I can prophesy. But can you also mature and disciple children? No, I don't like children. That's, that's not my calling. Well, great. David went back to the sheep. Back to the sheep. And he didn't walk with this sheep on the shoulder. <coughs> I, they, don't, they don't know how much I pray. They don't know how much I fast. They don't know Samuel poured anointing on me, not on anybody else. That, that's just not fair. The church is, is not sensitive. No discernment whatsoever in this church. No discernment whatsoever by the pastor. David didn't have that chip on his shoulder. If you're too big for the sheep, you're too small for the throne. If you're too big to serve on the parking lot, you're too small to be used by God in the supernatural. God tests us and God molds our character that it's not about us. That we don't become celebrities, but we are servants in God's kingdom. That we become big in our own head, we become humble and we don't use our serving as a stepping stone. If you don't serve another man's vision, nobody will give you yours. David gets this anointing, he ends up serving a king that really sat on his chair. It was David's position and David is serving that man. David is guarding that man. You don't see David stabbing that man. You don't see David prayerfully considering and say, Lord, give him a heart attack. Lord, kill that sucker. Lord, kill that man. Lord, take him to heaven faster. Lord, he really wants to be in the, in, over there with you because he's sitting on my place. Saul, do you know that this is my place? No, David is guarding and when Saul died, David cried, not giggled. He didn't have a glee on his face. He had tears on his face. Why? Because he genuinely believed in serving another man's vision for a long time. And not constantly reminding him, hey, so when is my transition? When you honor the anointing in others, God will increase it in you. And David had to do that for a long time, for years upon years, walking in that humility. Some of you come to Hungry Gen and you have a great anointing upon your life. In fact, you were pastors in your previous season or previous place that you came in. Some of you come to Hungry Gen and you're educated, you're skilled and you can serve in so many capacities. But today what you are doing, and I'm just going to speak boldly, is you, you think of yourself too high. So what you're doing is you're sitting and you're not participating in anything. Then somebody comes to you, the pastor Vlad comes to you and recognizes how great of a man or a woman of God you are and asks you to do something. I want to ask you that in our house, every hand is on the deck. We all serve God's purpose. And I want to ask you to please get out from the bleachers and jump in the game. I want to ask you, if you came and you sat already for four months, three months, I want to invite you to serve God's purpose in this church. If God planted you here, I want you to flourish here for the glory of God. God isn't looking for spectators. He is looking for sons that serve. Stop having this thing like the prodigal son. Give me what is mine. Do what prodigal son did when he came back and he says, here I am, make me one of your servants. Lord, I'm here to serve. Lord, where can I find a place to serve? Not where can I find something that matches my anointing, but where can I find something where there is a need and let me serve. And as you begin to serve, you begin to notice you meet other people and God starts promoting you and you start giving, be given more opportunities. The grace of God starts flowing in your life. I want to invite you, add your gifts, your talents to what God is doing at Hungry Gen. Give your resources, give your finances, give your skills so that the kingdom of God is is built. Through that, God is developing your character. Through that, God is developing the anointing in your life and He will use you for His glory. In the process, I knew that I was anointed by God to be a pastor, but I had to learn Photoshop. I had to learn Dreamweaver. I had to learn Final Cut Pro. I had to learn YouTube and how to cut videos and upload them to YouTube. Until this day, learning ProPresenter a little bit today. Why? Because at the end of the day, I'm not walking around with just a big head. I want to have a big heart that believes in serving God's house. And we are here servants, not celebrities. Church doesn't exist for me. I exist to serve its cause and its purpose for the glory of God. Can somebody say Amen? amen. And then on God's time, God promotes. 
when he chooses to promote and if tomorrow he chooses not to and we need to step back into the background it is what it is we will serve in the background why because ultimately is we serve the king not the spotlight can somebody say amen that's why you see at our church you see the team is constantly being elevated you see the team constantly being preferred. You see the team be giving opportunities. Why? Because our church is not about a belly button where everything is about one man. Everything is through him, by him, for him and that. No, our church is about the mission of Jesus Christ. We all have our hand in the deck and we're growing together so we have a skin in that game. Can somebody say amen? amen. And lastly, what I want to highlight. Yeah, let's give the golf club. <laughs> so, come on somebody. The last thing that I want to highlight is those who lack purpose will distract themselves with pleasure. David finally succeeded. David finally became the king. He was amazing as a king until one day. David in his success lost sight of what it means to be significant in God's eyes. And the Bible makes it clear when it was a time for kings to go to battle. David decided to, you know, I fought a lot already. I deserve a break. Let the young bloods go and slay giants. I'm going to stay home and I'm going to Netflix and chill. I mean, I'm just going to chill. I'm just going to hang out. I'm just going to, you know, I, I think my time is over to fight. But I find it interesting. The Bible says when it was time for kings to go to battle, David was a king. He wasn't anointed to sleep day and night. He was anointed to slay. And the scripture says, David finds himself in the battle with his eyes. He fought Goliaths, giants and won. Now he's facing a battle and he can't win. He sees a woman and I was in Jerusalem in the city of David. So they gave us the place where David's palace was at and you can pretty much see down the mountain. You could see the houses and, and uh, Bathsheba didn't have shower curtains and um, one thing led to another. David finds himself committing sin. David isn't the only one. This temptation exists within every person who has this feeling, I arrived. And you stop doing God's purpose and you get distracted with pleasure, popularity or some other P word that just distracts you and takes you down the drain. And we see this happening with pastors. We see this happening with leaders, with businessmen. Drugs come in drinking comes in, immorality comes in and you see success and slipping, sipping, tripping and then that success was harder to manage than heavy stress in their life. A few, a few weeks ago when I was, I went to the mountain for a few days before the conference to pray and this verse hit me like ton, ton of bricks. David, after he served his own generation by the will of God. You know, after David repented of his sin, he made it his goal not to serve success. He was already successful. But to use his success to serve God in his generation. And this is my vow. And I pray that you will make that as well. Lord, I don't want to serve my agenda. I want to serve you in my generation. When I arrive in people's minds, when I arrive in my own mind and get blown away, God, you're so good, you're so faithful. You blessed me with so much to understand that in that stage of my life, this is where I have to serve God in my generation. Be passionate for God in my generation. Be passionate for my purpose in my generation. More people saved for Jesus. More people healed by Jesus. More people delivered by Jesus. More churches planted by Jesus. Why? Because it's no longer about reaching my goal. It's about reaching God's goal for my generation. Serving God in my generation. May this be our motto serving God in our generation. We're not trying to serve our generation because that is a fallacy. If we say, well, I'm just trying to serve my generation, then you will run over your family. 
symbolically speaking. Because you will do whatever it takes to reach as many people for Jesus as possible. That's not what the Bible says in here. The original translation says this, God served, David served God in his generation. That means sometimes you're in the spotlight serving God in your generation. Sometimes you're in the wilderness serving God in your generation. Sometimes you are behind the scenes serving God in your generation. And sometimes you're like my great-grandfather. You were in jail for five years serving God in your generation. Sometimes you're reaching millions of people on YouTube. And sometimes like my friend from Vietnam who's arrested right now. And 10 people from his church in Vietnam for preaching the gospel. And he's serving God in his generation. So when we stand before God, God is not going to ask how many people you reached. He will say, how passionately did you serve me in your generation? Because to the previous generation, I gave them Smith Wigglesworth. I gave them Bunyan. I gave them these pastors like Martin Luther. I gave them John Calvin. I gave them all these pastors, Catherine Kuhlman. But to your generation, I gave them you. The Bible says here, to them, to Israel, he gave David. Nation of Israel didn't belong to David. David belonged to the nation of Israel. Our generation doesn't belong to us. We belong to our generation. And that in our generation, we serve God's purpose. In our schools, in our universities, and in our colleges. That every moment of your life is dedicated to this. Whether you are a young person right now and you have more passion than you have more out, than outlet, or you're an older person, Passion is a little bit lower, but you got a lot of money. You got a lot of wisdom and you have more time. I want to ask that each and every one of us, we evaluate our life. Whether you're a businessman, stay home mom, a busy father, college student, that we serve God in our generation for the glory of God. Race to deliver is our way of serving God in our generation. Last verse I'm going to read and that is Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I don't think I gave this verse to the team in the back. So if they can find it, that would be good. If not, I'm going to read it. Because, now this is more negative. Because you did not serve God, the Lord your God, with joy and gladness of heart, for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you will serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything. Now, this is not to scare anybody into serving God. But if that is the method that works for some of us, let me use that. I regularly go to this verse when things are good, when there's blessing everywhere, when this year has been one of the craziest, best years of my life. Seeing, seeing the blessing of God in a way that, that it just never happened before. It's easy to get complacent. It's easy to develop entitlement. It's easy to say, well, I arrived. I don't need to burn. I don't need to fast as much. I don't need to press in. I don't need to give. I don't need to stretch myself as much. You know, we don't even have room at the church. Let's just plateau until we get into a new building. Let's just relax. I'm all for rest. But the chillaxing part where you withdraw from your purpose is a dangerous place because God says, when you don't serve me in abundance of everything, there is someone who's waiting for you in the place of chillaxing to rob your prosperity, rob your gifts. David experienced that when he didn't serve God and his purpose in his generation and found himself in a chillaxing, complacent, ah, uh, I've done a lot already, you know, it's just, I'm retired, I'm, I'm done, I just know, just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good, just living my life like that. He found himself in a battle God never meant him to fight and he lost that battle. I'm not against retirement. I'm not against rest. But I do believe God gave you breath and you owe your life and my life every day to serve Him. We have to remove this idea. I believe in God, I just don't serve Him. You can't believe in God and not serve Him. Demons believe like that and they're demons and they're still going to hell. This idea that I just believe in God and that's it, leave me alone, come to church for a check mark. The casual Christianity is over. Sitting on a fence, halfway in the world and halfway in God is over. And like our teenagers like to say, the devil owns the fence. We got to jump off the fence 
and either we serve the devil fully or we serve God fully but this whole thing in between casual mediocre complacent I'm just tired just don't have time just too busy that doesn't exist for us anymore we are a church that loves passionately to pursue God and radically serve his cause in our generation amen God wants to use us I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to every person that's been serving. I want to ask every person that is serving at Hungry Gen. Life will only get harder. That's why you got to spend your time on your knees. I want to invite you to prayer every Wednesday. In fact, every day, but specifically every Wednesday. I want to invite you to take time to spend time with Jesus every day. Don't use your gift as your crutch. Get on your knees before Jesus and receive the power that you need to burn on fire for Jesus while you are in ministry watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoy these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.